My name is Merrill Zubro, CEO of Mock Research and the chair of the MSMR Program Advisory Board at Michigan State University. I'm really excited to be part of Spartan Insights. Today's guest on Spartan Insights is none other than Michael Brary, executive and resident of the MSMR Michigan State University. Michael, thanks so much for being a guest on Spartan Insights. Great to be here. I appreciate the invitation, Merrill. Absolutely. So, Michael, let's get into it a little bit. It'd be a great place to start with sort of a brief history about your career. I started where I'm, I'm guessing quite a few people who are listening are either at right now or about to be. As I started as an analyst. Back then, it was a sales and marketing analyst. I was at General Motors. Yeah, this is going back in the 80s. Somewhere along the line, I got involved not with sales data, but marketing, marketing research data. And, and I remember specifically, it was working with our advertising agencies and helping them position vehicles and create the commercials, a- advertising for them. And um, up until that point, again, this was the 80s, it was largely a creative process. It was sort of like, okay, should we, you know, what should we do? Well, who are we showing the corner? Oh, maybe a red car, you know, going around the corner fast and blowing some leaves around. That sounds cool. It wasn't a very data-driven kind of process. And I was asked to use the syndicated buyer behavior research in the automotive industry to help the ad agencies kind of do a more fact-based approach to positioning. And I remember that was the kind of the turning point for me. I remember doing a presentation to all these seasoned advertising folks. And I was saying, yeah, the, here's what's on the minds of the people that you're trying to sell to, that you're trying to target. And, and right now they're shopping for this other kind of car. And this is what they have in the garage. And they're going to dispose of this. And this is kind of where they're at on these kind of social issues and so forth. So instead of a car going around the corner fast, maybe it should be a car you know, at a tailgate. Or it should be a car unloading kids at, at a soccer game. Right because here's what's going on with these people. Here's their voice. Here's what they care about. Here's who they are. It, it was such an amazing thing. At that point, and the light bulb went off for me right now because I saw how these folks were really responding to this and how they made changes immediately and how very quickly it had a serious impact and a very positive impact on our positioning of the vehicles. And it was at that point I said, wow, this is kind of cool for some geeky data-driven math stuff, this is pretty cool. We can really make a difference. And not many people were involved in it at a real application level. And that's where I said, okay, I'm going to chase this. I ended up into the agency side because back then a company like General Motors really didn't have a lot of inside resources that were doing this. And I just, that started me down this road and I stayed my entire career and actually most of it working for the same company in this field. That's amazing. I mean, basically, you worked your way up. You had a number of jobs at Maritz. I remember being a competitor of yours when I was at a number of the companies that we we did battle with over the years. You know, you had, I don't know, five, six, seven jobs at Maritz, and you were the king at Maritz. I mean, the president and CEO, you spent close to probably 28 years there. What are some of your fond memories that you had when you were at Maritz? Timing, you're, you're right. Timing was was wonderful for me. I Again, that's a time when you could stay with the company for 28 years. In the, our industry, the whole interest in marketing research grew tremendously in that period. And it was very fortunate the company did very well and grew tremendously in that period. And I always seemed to be kind of staying in the right place at the right time. And so, yeah, I ended up as a CEO there for, for the last 11 years. It was just wonderful and enabled me to retire in an early age as, as well. But during that, I would say to answer your question in terms of the fondest memories from a business perspective, it was around the, the 90s, the 90s, so where the whole idea of customer experience, customer satisfaction came to the forefront. We placed a bet that that was going to be a big focus for companies in general because the idea of customer experience, understanding customer experience, yeah, it was there, but it, it wasn't really a big area of focus for an organization. And that changed. And we got on that bandwagon. And I spent much of my time focusing the company specifically on the customer experience offering. And wow, that took off. We were sitting right at the right place. And the great thing for me was it was something I could focus, I could orient the whole company against, as opposed to everything marketing research, we could really be 
experts, specifically a customer experience. I, I love that. I, I love focus. I love being just really nailing something. And as a company, we were able to do that. So that was a lot of fun. Yeah, no, you guys had a great reputation on your leadership. I mean, it was one of the, the largest prominent agencies, frankly, in the world. And I know how proud you are of that. So let's segue a little bit. So there you are, you're minding your own business, you're running a huge company in Marath, and then you have this idea, this light bulb goes off, you're like, hey, maybe I should help out or start a program, an MSMR program at Michigan State University. Is that kind of how it went down? It started a little earlier than that. When I was at Merit and in that role of those years, I was also very involved, like a like year today, in, in the industry. I was somebody who enjoyed networking every day, and I enjoyed being part of the industry, not just part of a company, getting involved in all the associations and really trying to steer the industry as well as a company, being part of the group that was adding at the industry level. So... I was involved in a lot of associations and there was always specific issues that we would be focusing on. And one that in that kind of role that I was really focusing on was one of my kind of pet areas of sort of a mission was, is I just felt that our industry didn't have access to a lot of universities who were graduating folks in master's of marketing research. I thought it was, it was relatively easy to hire researchers, but it was very difficult to find researchers and leaders or people who, who are going to be the company leaders. And it was sort of like lots of MBAs, but an MBA with a specific area of expertise and focus around insights. And there just wasn't a lot out there. And, and I thought that was a real gap, a real opportunity. And, one of the things I did while being involved in these industry associations was I, was I was knocking on doors of the universities, and there were a couple others who were doing it as well, um, and saying, listen, if you could start a master's in marketing research program, I'll help put together a coalition of suppliers and clients, and we'll help fund it, and we'll get the resources you need, and awareness, and so forth, if you would do that. Well, it just so happened, one of the... Uh, doors I was knocking on was Michigan State University. And this was in 2007. And at that time, they said, oh, by the way, um, yeah, we've been thinking about the same thing. So let's do it. Yeah, going back to 2007. And so I worked together at the time. It was Professor Richard Sprang. And the department chair said, yeah, could you work with this guy over here and help launch? And so we did. And it kind of slowed down during the recession times. But then finally, the MSMR program here got launched in, in 2011. And so I stayed involved, helped put together a board, did a guest lecture and so forth, get it going. And then when I retired, the university said, hey, in retirement, would you also like to come here and, and join the faculty? So that's how I got involved. That's it was a wonderful transition for me and allows me to stay really engaged in the industry. It's a great story, Michael, and thanks for sharing. I know the listeners will really appreciate that. So here we are in less than 10 years with your help, Dr. Spring, obviously Jessica Richards, and a bunch of other people. It's the number one MSMR program in the world. You have a big smile on your face, but how were we able to do that in such a short amount of time? I think there are a few particular drivers on that. So one is, is right from the very beginning, we put a focus on this program as being very, very application oriented. So in addition to a great academic foundation, there would be a huge emphasis on application, on direct engagement in the industry. And so internships are a really, really important part. And a lot of involvement of the industry. So that's kind of one of my, my major roles in here is just staying involved, yes, teaching, but staying involved in the industry on the commercial side and constantly finding people and inviting people in who can be out of the business world, who can be guest lecturing classes, that can be working directly with students on projects, that be hiring and be for internships, adding to curriculum ideas on how to have a very up-to-date curriculum. 
So I think that's probably one of the number one drivers is being very connected to the outside, being a, a very application oriented so that our students are well connected in the industry before they graduate. They're walking into roles with great experience in internships and networked already because of how we structured this. I think words got out and that's a big yeah. deal. I think that's great. I mean, look, both of us collectively have probably been in the insights community, if I had to guess, for probably 70 years. I know my gray hairs are real. And I would suggest that this is the most changes that we've ever had in the insights community in the history of my career. And if I had to guess, you feel the same way. Let's talk about some of those changes. But more important, Michael, let's talk about what the program is doing to make sure that everybody who graduates from the program is well positioned using it as a springboard for their career. I think that's a real important issue. Um, And it would probably be the number two thing I would bring up in terms of what's driving success of this program. And that is adapting to designing it toward all the change that's occurring in this space. Because The fact is, is over the last seven years, our space, so the insights, has been under tremendous disruption and tremendous, therefore, transformation. That's one of the things that we're very focused on in the design of the program and in preparing our students as they leave here. If you think back, for for those of you who are listening who have been around quite a while, the marketing research industry or insights industry, whatever you want to call it, was for a lot of years, for a lot of decades, was a pretty sleepy place, very predictable. And then I would say it was sort of like our version of big data hit. And all of a sudden, a lot of new players came into the space and started really disrupting and therefore requiring transformation in terms of how we look at this business. Because if you go back, to our early days, you know, I mean, if you think about what our value was to companies, it was all about getting data. That's how we monetized our business. If we go back 20 years or so, it was gathering data. Data was a scarce resource. We went out and got market data for companies. And that was really the business model. Of course, that has just so changed so quickly with just the ubiquity of data and digitization of data and mobile devices and and so forth. Now, now data are everywhere, right? Now now people call me and say, well, I'm drowning in data. Don't give me more data. So the value is not so much gathering the data now as much as doing something with it. It's managing it, it's interpreting, it's analyzing, it's visualizing the data. And that's really the business model. Therefore, it has brought in so many new players into our space, non-traditional market research players, right from two guys in a garage that has some app that they were using yesterday for travel business. And somebody said, oh, you know, but you're kind of also collecting some data and kind of doing some visualization. You could be a marketing research tool too. All of a sudden they're in the space. At the end, you've got Salesforce and Oracle and SAP and, and Microsoft and so forth that used to be just suppliers to us in this space. Well, now they say, oh, you know, I got this big data management platform. I can hang a voice of the customer module on that. Voila. Now they're a competitor as well. All these other players are in this space. All these new tools are in this space. And you can view that as wonderful or you can view that as threatening. But I think that creates, therefore, the real remit for the next generation of leader in this space and therefore an opportunity for our MSMR program because our space is in flux and it's going to be for quite a while because we've got the traditional and we've got the emerging. The fact is, is we need people who understand, who get both of those, who understand the solid time-tested fundamentals of things that are being taught and been taught for decades in marketing research in terms of you know, probability sampling and precision and accuracy and projectability and all those things, and understand how that traditional space is just being disrupted and all these emerging players are coming in. And now there's all these DIY tools and shiny things and 
collecting data so quickly and speed over accuracy and so forth. And people that can say, and, and I get these are wonderful tools and here's how they fit into the organization. But be aware that this particular tool is shiny and bright and great for just the general understanding of direction, but don't go selling the farm on it because of accuracy, kind of the traditional projectability kind of issues. That's a big opportunity to have people, that next generation of leader that understand, that have a foot in both sides of that and can bridge that gap for some time as we kind of work through this flex. And this is going to go on for years and years. And just to actually reinforce that, I just read two studies in the last couple of weeks. One was by SMR, Merrill, and the other was by Green Book Grit. And they were yep. talking about trends and so forth in the industry. But they both supported this whole idea that on the brand side, on the client side, there's a continuous movement. So one of them uses kind of the democratization of insights. But basically it said the function is moving into the hands of the end user more and more. Whereas if you looked at like a Procter & Gamble or something like that, which has always been a, a marketing research department that traditionally did the research and then handed it off and then gave the results to the product designers, the end users. Well, now more and more, with all these tools and the access to data and so forth, moving into the do-it-yourself capabilities and moving into the hands of the end user. So they say, don't worry about it, I, I got this. And a lot of these studies were saying in the past year, because of what's been happening because of the pandemic and so forth and people working from home, it's accelerated it that much more. So if you're in the traditional market research department there, maybe you're going to be doing a lot less actually doing the research for the end user as much as kind of facilitating the organization doing research and doing it well and understanding the limitations and so forth. And I just think that's a far greater leadership task in our space than just doing the research. I think that just also kind of reinforces the direction we're taking in this program and all about having our graduates not only be great foundational researchers, but also being able to kind of articulate a vision of where this industry is going and being able to walk into their future employer and saying, hey, I believe this is where the industry is going and this is the disruption that's occurring. And here's how to turn this into a positive. Here's how to not only survive, but here's how we as a company can thrive in this changing yeah. world. And to me, that, that's the future leader. When I first started talking about what I was envisioning when I was in the industry 15 years ago, it was creating that kind of person that could be that kind of leader. That's very, very exciting to be part of that. Well, let's end with this because I really like how you frame that. And I think there's going to be a ton of takeaways for, as you said, the next generation of superstars, of leaders, right? So in terms of one or two pieces of advice that you would give the current students that will be graduating in the next year or so, you know, what advice would you give them? I would focus on kind of what I was just talking about the last couple of minutes in terms of use this time to get good at articulating a point of view about where this industry is going and how you personally see yourself fitting into that. Because yes, you're going to be competing with a whole bunch of other people out there for jobs who have really good fundamental skill sets in insights and analytics and so forth. But you can truly differentiate yourself by doing the and. It means that and being able to say, this is where this industry is going. This is my point of view. Here's how things are changing, and here's how I think 
I can fit in and really lead in that change. Yeah. That's gold. That's great. Hopefully a number of the future leaders will listen to you, will take your advice, will put that approach into practice. And if they do, they'll be beyond successful. Michael, I can't thank you enough for your time today on Spartan Insight. My name is Merrill Dubrow. Thanks for listening.